some slides. Um, we're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff, you know, MVC, um, separating everything into their own uh, isolated concerns. Just as a reminder, in the actual unit, um, there's this Connects MVC template. And when you click on it, um, you have this repository here available for you. So that way um, you don't have to do all the grunt work of setting up all the files, all the directories and everything. So don't forget about this repository. It makes it really easy to just get off the ground really quick using uh, Connects MVC and all that stuff that we know that we're familiar with. So just to kind of go back over, we're all familiar with like CRUD, you know, um, create, read, update, delete, destroy. Um, these are just some examples, you know, HTTP verbs that we've been working with. Um, and then we're going to be talking about handling changes on the client briefly. When the client receives a response, that response might include some new data, which affects the current status of the program. We're all familiar with that. You know, maybe a client clicks on a certain link and then you have to generate a new view file. Because of the change of the program status, some variables that are being presented by components might need to re-render themselves to represent the new data. So um, when we're talking about components in this context, we're just simply saying our views. So depending on what the user clicks on, what they input, when you re-render a view, the information might have changed or maybe it's manipulated in some way. So we want to make sure that when the user interacts with your application, that the components that are displaying that data or are operating off of the data uh, actually change and re-render and show that to the client. So application state, what is that? Variables which trigger a re-rendering of their components upon change are known as state. So this is essentially just keeping track of all of the variables in an isolated instance that you know you need to keep track of. Maybe like um, if a user is logged in, for instance, that's something that you don't want disappearing if you go to a different page because then all of a sudden they have access to routes that they don't, that they shouldn't have and all that. So generally not considered good to uh, <laughs> change the state outside of, you know, triggering specifically exactly what you want to happen. And not all state changes need to be re-rendered immediately to the screen. Some frameworks distinguish state variables in this category in order to offer a simplified version of the interface. So just because your state changes doesn't mean that everything needs to re-render. This is something that you guys are going to get more practice with, especially with React. This is uh, pertaining a little bit more to React, but still makes sense in the context of what we're talking about. And so uh, this is kind of talking about uh, like React and all that. So we're going to kind of skip over this, but I just wanted to go over that brief synopsis essentially of like what we're talking about with state and what we're trying to accomplish with the user experience. So this is the first slide on actual MVC. So we're going over the secret rules. And so what does it mean? Does anybody know? No. Boom, model view controller, correct. So it stands for three essentially separated individual concerns. Um, the model is going to be talking to the database. The view is going to be serving the data to the user. And the controller is kind of like in between making sure that everything is kind of moving back and forth um, as intended, as expected. So in practice, we most often use the term to describe software architecture or frameworks. Um, generally, it's not actually like a program or like a li like. MVC is more of like a, um, you know, a development um, idea or paradigm. It's, it's more so like, you know, dry code versus wet code. MVC isn't really like a program you can install. It's just like a development workflow that you can follow or the way that you would structure your repositories or, pro or projects or programs. So it's not actually a specific one thing. It's just a, a paradigm of how you should be um, setting up your code and structuring everything. So MVC architecture, a proposal for how to organize code in the user facing application. So we're going to be breaking apart everything, making sure that everything is separated based upon exactly what its functionality is meant to do. We'll get into that in a little bit. It has uh, multiple interpretations historically. Um, like I said, it's more so just of like an idea or a concept rather than an actual technology. And it sorts into three separate types of object class components, uh, models, views, and controllers. 
Oh, and there you go. So uh, we have the model which manages the program state. We're familiar with this with like connects um, and the DB. That's essentially our model at this time where we're using connects to communicate with the data that we have in our tables and making sure that we're serving the correct data based upon the parameters and conditionals that we're writing. The view is obviously what eventually the client ends up viewing and um, interacting with and all that. And then the controller receives the input from the user and then will um, will operate changes based upon whatever the user input. We're pretty familiar with this by creating, you know, our routes and, you know, moving around and stuff like that inside of our applications. So we're going to be using an MVC framework, which is a library that lets, uh, pardon me, that helps you write code in the MVC style of architecture. So it's the MVC style. Again, it's more of a concept. And we can do some things automatically since it knows you'll be writing in that style. So how does it help us? Using the three components allows for separation of concerns. So as I said before, this is going to make it a lot easier for programming. Once you're done setting everything up, setting everything up can be a little cumbersome at first, but once you finally have everything separated and ready to go, this makes it a lot easier to just kind of jump in and start creating routes, start creating views, make it so that you have like more functionality in your application and it does it in a very organized and easy to understand way once you finally grasp the concept of MVC. So there's limits on interactions between modules of different types of components, limits on interactions between modules within a type of component, and um, when we're breaking each component into many modules, this allows reasoning and isolation. So again, we're trying to completely take our app and separate it into things or, or files or, you know, functions where it only is operating where it is specifically required or where it's, it makes sense to in that context. Whereas previously we had our server file and it was completely bloated with all of this connects calls and all these routes and all that, you know, it's, it kind of gets bloated, hard to understand, hard to read. Now we're going to be separating all of that and making sure that when we're creating our applications, we know exactly where to go to see the routes. We know exactly where to go to see exactly what the functionality is happening when we hit that route. And we can um, go in and customize our views as we see fit after it receives the information that we render the page with. So static analysis limits on code. So for example, code for different view models lives in different files without references to each other. So again, we're isolating everything. We're making sure that when this page loads, it's loading based upon the functionality I wrote in this one file, and it's not communicating with anything else. That's our goal, is we don't want other files communicating with other files that they don't need to be, because that bloats everything. It introduces you know, errors that otherwise wouldn't be there if it wasn't trying to reference a bunch of different files. So we want to keep everything isolated um, apart from one another. And uh, runtime limits on objects. Uh, so different view objects will have limited access to other view objects. So in this context, um, it's a little bit more, I would say, like leaning on like React or Angular. But essentially, um, in the future, we'll have different views inside different views. And then we'll have it so that if the parent view has some sort of state change, then the child view can change and re-render different information. So right now, we're not going to be worrying about this too much, but just know that it's possible to also have like nested views inside of each other that conditionally render based upon how you have your controller set up and all that jazz. So the MVC interaction, this is a funny slide. Uh, there's the model and next slide. So why would I want a model instance? It will represent an encapsulation of related data and behavior. So like I said, with our connects, we're going to be storing and referencing the state data of our application as we're using it. So a model instance should be able to have relationships to other model instances, perhaps represented as properties. Intervene on property access to facilitate binding. This is optional. Um, again, this is where you would have like the parent container with the child container and the child container is bound to the parent. And then like once the parent sees that something needs to be re-rendered, then it would re-render the child component. That would be binding. Uh, provide an uh, venting interface. Again, this is optional, but you know, if like some sort of event happens, then you can specifically run some sort of functionality or logic. What it should never do is have any knowledge uh, 
pardon me, have knowledge of any more other models than necessary. So again, we, we're trying to isolate our concerns. We're trying to make it so that when a user is being served a, a specific view file, that that view file is only touching functionality and logic pertaining to that one file. We don't want our model instance to have knowledge of any other views that it doesn't pertain to whatsoever. And so now we're gonna talk about collection instances. So a collection instance would be to get the same benefits as a model instance, but provide some array-like features. And not all MVC frameworks provide collections, but some of them do, I don't know off the top of my head. So an MVC interaction, we have this model, we have our connects, what would happen in this is we would generate the view and then that would go to the DOM and actually generate our view files. So when, when we use the model, we tell the view, hey, uh, here's all this information. I need you to render this page now. And so once it gets that information, then the view actually talks to the DOM and starts generating all of these elements that we created based upon how you specified it in the views file using EJS. This isn't the entirety of how all of this works, but this is just kind of like a snapshot of where we're at right now. So why would we want a view instance? I think we can kind of uh, <laughs> figure that one out on our own, but essentially it will represent the mapping of one model instance to another on-screen uh, rectangle, essentially just re-rendering other components, other views based upon conditionals we're setting, essentially. And it's a map from abstract truth to user experience. So what this means is we're going to be having the state stored for the user. And as the user is interacting with the, the state, it's going to be mutating it and changing it as far as like how it pertains to them. So it's kind of abstract that it's not an absolute source of truth, but it's their version of the truth that we set up for them to interact with. A view instance should also correspond with a single DOM node. This essentially just means one document. Um, you don't ever want to have like, you know, one view that is supposed to be like two pages um, for obvious reasons. So not all DOM nodes have associated view instances. Maybe you have like a very small like hyperlink uh, as a view for, for some reason. Um, that doesn't necessarily need to have an associated view instance. It would just be you click on the hyperlink and you're done. Compose itself out of subview. So, you know, the parent children relationship that we spoke about before. This is optional. You don't actually need to do this. Like I said, we're probably not going to be doing this parent child relationship, but it's good to understand that that's like a practice with MVC, especially as we start to work with uh, React. This is a very important uh, part of React where all of our essentially views will be composed of subviews. So, your, your home page is going to have multiple components like a side nav and that will be its own component as well as a, a header file which is going to be its own component and then together the view will be comprised of all of those different files but at this moment we're working with express we don't have to worry about that too much but it is a principle of mvc overall um, possibly keeping references to the, the subviews parent child relationship again listening for events to maybe render a different page or display any relevant information that the user may want from the database. We want to avoid model instances depending on view instances. So we want to be generating the views based off of the controller. We do not want to be using the model necessarily to be generating the views. And uh, we were going to be setting up a controller for user input or optionally we can have a controller itself act as the in-between uh, of the model and the view. So, or you could have a view necessarily act as a controller itself. I've, I haven't seen this in practice, but it's certainly possible. View instance should never have any knowledge of sibling views. So when, I'm, when we're talking about sibling views, obviously we're talking about um, related views that don't necessarily pertain to one another. It's not talking about the parent to child relationship. So when it says it should never have sibling views, again, we don't want like two view pages associated with like one route. We want to make sure that everything is isolated and concerned and that everything has its own completely separated uh, concerns and functionality from everything else. We never will want to run a full search of the DOM as we're loading the page. Uh, 
uh, we don't want the child node to have knowledge of its parent view because we want the parent to be overall controlling the child view. Optional. And uh, it should never have any knowledge of any models other than the one that it is projecting again, isolation. So before I continue on, that was quite a bit of information. Does anybody have questions as far as what I just talked about? Anthony? Uh, what do you mean? Essentially, you don't want the view to be the controller. The view will be uh, essentially a route. It will, pardon me. The view will contain a route like a hyperlink like we're used to that will actually send a request to the controller. And then at that point, the controller will make the appropriate request and then communicate with the database and then re-render a different view page. Is that good? Does that make sense? It's Monday. I'm really tired, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm, I'm explaining this uh, the best the best I can. Um, but yeah, once at, at first it's a little daunting, but once you get the idea of exactly what's going on, it's it's really really easy. Um, it's just like the initial understanding and the the first aha moment that's kind of hard to grasp as far as like when you're first jumping into MVC. Are there any other questions, Seth? Um, essentially, you wouldn't want to have a view page like um, running a for loop and checking for every single like p tag or anything like that. Yeah, so like it, you don't want to have like a for loop searching the entire DOM object essentially is what they were saying by that. Any other questions before I move on? All right, awesome. So here we can kind of finish the functional flow of what MVC looks like. So we have our model, which will generate the view, and then it will talk to the DOM. And then from the DOM, we will have our route set up so that the controller can talk to the model, which can talk to the view, generate the DOM. So essentially what's going on here is your server will start up and we have our uh, connects database up here. And then a user will hit a route that's kind of missing right here, but after the route is hit, then the view will be generated. And as they interact with the DOM elements, you know, if they hit like some sort of hyperlink, like the login link, that will go to our controller instead of our typical like server file. And then it'll say, okay, what am I supposed to do when the route is slash login? So it, it, it runs the functionality that we wrote for when we hit slash login, it talks to connects and says, hey, I need these rows based upon the conditional set from our routes for the controller. And then as we come back up to the model, we have the information that we need that we can come down to the view and then generate the DOM again. So this isn't necessarily how the workflow is going to work, but functionally, this is kind of how everything ties together. Um, real quick sidebar, when we're actually working with MVC, what you'll probably see is you'll have your server first. This is the number one concern that you want to worry about. And then we're gonna come down. And then the second thing we want to worry about is creating our routes. From routes, it'll talk to our controller. And then finally, that will generate the view. So, and then we come back up here. So functionally speaking, this is uh, how it's all working under the hood. But when we're actually working with MVC, as far as workflow, what you wanna do is set up your server, get it running, make sure that it's working. And then the first thing you wanna do is start setting up the routes that you know you'll need. So like a home page, a login page, a register page, all that. Then you're gonna go to your controller. And after you've set up all these routes, you'll name your functions based upon the routes that you just specified. And so that way we're building out, okay, so if the user hits this, where in the database am I going to query to make sure that I give them the relevant data? So we hit the route, the controller's like, okay, I need to grab this from the model. And then once it has all of the information, then it's going to generate the view 
based upon you typing in res.render and then passing in that object to the view so that way we can display the relevant data to the user. And then uh, so on and so forth. So then we hit a route, go to the controller, blah, 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 blah. Um, this, this is uh, the workflow I recommend when you're working with MVC. This doesn't necessarily dive into like, if you were programming, where would you start? Um, but this right here, I highly recommend get your server up and running, write your routes, go to your controller, set up the functionality for the routes, and then uh, build your view files based upon the information that you know you're getting from your controller. So why would we want a controller instance? So it represents the mapping from one user behavior to user intent within one region. Some frameworks put this in the view. I don't think um, Express does that. So a controller can listen for DOM events, such as like on click, um, you know, event listeners, we're all familiar with that. Transform DOM elements into intention by invoking methods on the model. And um, essentially it's, it's just checking and listening constantly for what routes are being hit, what information we're asking to be rendered and, and what uh, needs to be accessed. But a controller instance should never have knowledge of any views. Um, this is kind of this is kind of a weird bullet point because in the controller um, page in the controller file that we're going to be working with, you will be rendering the views. But um, in this bullet point, I think what they meant is like you don't want to be writing any functionality for your view inside of the controller. You want to make sure that your views are separated from your controller, not having them combined into into one file. And we don't want our controller instance to have knowledge of more models than the one that it was given at construction time, for obvious reasons. Be a dumping ground for homeless logic. Obviously, I think that applies to like everything we do. Um, you don't want to be just dumping random information that you think will be useful at one time, but then never ends up being useful. We want to make sure that we're setting up our controller instances so that it's doing exactly what we anticipated to, and it's also um, not touching anything other than what we anticipated to work with. So yeah, if, if, if we're following the previous rules that we set, we shouldn't be dumping useless logic inside of our controller. And so now we get a bit of more of an in-depth look at this. So um, the model updates the view, which then renders the DOM. And then when the DOM receives the user input, it hits the controller, which then queries the model but then essentially the controller will then generate the view with the updates from the model, at least when we're using Express, and then you know the loop continues, so on and so forth. Graph slash tree disparity. So this is essentially just a breakdown of what components and views would look like. Um, I think that this more pertains to like React or Angular. So, um, I don't want to go too much in depth into this just because we haven't hit that point yet. But, um, you know, when we're looking at this, we can see, you know, if we had a table with users, a users could have many posts, posts can have many comments, comments can have one friend, but users can have many friends. This kind of shows the relational structure of a, a relational database. So um, this would be a graph of our model of information um, displayed here. But this would be a tree um, if we were looking at our views. So obviously we start from one, one um, specific spot. So like at the beginning of your application, when it first loads up, this would be your home. Like you come on, you want to see your social media feed. And then you can either post or post, or you can uh, <laughs> like your post. You can also go and look at the comments, look at the likes. Essentially, this is just a breakdown of when we generate a view, all of the sub views that could exist inside of it. Obviously, we're not going to break down comments and likes into views in this moment, but this is, like I said, a little bit more pertinent to React when we're working with that. Um, and this is just more rules based upon, you know, a model should talk to other models as few as possible. A view should only be associated with one model and a controller should only be associated with one model as well. And then, you know, other views, uh, a view can only talk to its children. And then as far as a controller, you would only want it to talk to children controllers. We never want the children referencing the parent, at least at this point. 
got that. Any questions about what I just went over? Once again, that was kind of an information dump. We're going to get into the meat of things here. Last slide, MVC interaction, just to give you guys like a visual interpretation of what this is going to look like. So we have our state, which is our model, and then we have our view and we have our controller. So in, in this instance, state is actually model. You can just think of it like that. So in our database, we have a row and the columns are title, artist, and play state. And then the title is what I like, artist is Conbro chill, and the play state is stopped. So this is stored in our database. <laughs> this is stored in our database, you know, maybe in our connects file, whatever. And then in, in our view, we have a main player, which is associated with a controller. So main player would be like, a, you know, main player dot EJS. And so when this is bound to the state or the model, then we'll generate the view by rendering it. And so this is what our main player um, EJS file would look like. And so once this is rendered, we have another uh, view over here bind that to the state and then we render that as well so i'm sure we've all seen something like this before uh the way this would work with javascript and dom as far as mvc is we have user input on the view and when that's clicked it invokes a dom event like on click on click pause right and so then that goes to the dom uh that goes to the controller for that view and then that goes back up to the model and says, hey, I called play, I need this information to change or I need this information to be deleted, you know, CRUD, uh, we're all familiar with that. So in this instance, we're just gonna be changing the state. So instead of stop, we, we are saying that it's playing now because the user specifically clicked on this play button. So now it's playing, we've seen that there's a change and now we know that this has to re-render based upon the way our controller is set up. So now it re-renders again, and now what the user is seeing is that their interactivity with the component, with the view, actually did something. And now they're seeing like, oh, cool, this actually works. You know, Nothing would be more frustrating than if it just stayed a play button and you're sitting there and you're clicking and you're like, why is this not working? So this is the kind of goal that we're going for where we're giving users like visual, um, cues as to exactly what they're interacting with and, and like how it um, changes our application. So then once uh, we realize that the state has been changed to here, then we will send that down with our controller to the footer player. And then that will also re-render based upon the state change and show a, a, a pause sign instead of a plus sign. And so that essentially is the, the goal of using MVC is having separated views. Um, again, they're probably not going to be this separated, but in the future, you're going to be doing stuff like this with React, with other frameworks, uh, View and Angular. So this would be its own view, and that would be its own view. We're separating the concerns of these, so making sure that they only have one specific purpose. They're only meant to do one thing. And that way there's very little guesswork or wiggle room as, to far, as far as like room for error. So once again, another example, if the user clicks on this, it sends the DOM event on click, pause, goes to the controller, runs the function. Now we have changed the state using the model. Now that the model has changed, it triggers a change for the main player, which then re-renders back to the play sign. And then once we realize that that has happened, it sends another event to the footer player and also re-renders that component. That kind of makes sense to everybody. Thumbs up. You have a question? Um, that's not necessarily wrong. That's why I, I, I was trying to say with the caveat that this is probably more pertinent to React and like other frameworks that we're going to be working with in the future. Um, this would be more so like if you could think of this as one view page. So this is like your home page. And then when you click on the home button, it sends that home button thing up here. And then 
changes the state as necessary, and then it will re-render another page. And so, so this, is, this is a little abstracted. We're not gonna be working with components or views this small, but this is just an example of like the functionality flow of MVC. So um, this, this isn't like correct and your way is incorrect. This is just more of an example of what it would look like with like React or something. <clears throat> The reason I, I get what you're saying, Ed. so the, the universal source of truth is our database up here. So everything is kind of operating based off our database and what data that we have available in our state. And so um, I don't, this is mimicking um, SoundCloud. I don't know if you've ever gone there, but uh, essentially SoundCloud would look something like this where, you know, you have your URL bar and up here you have this, the Combro, what I like. So we'll just do con, right? And then if you want, you can hit the play button. But then there's a ton of songs that they have listed beneath that. And then all the way at the bottom of the page is where that right one is, where it's, uh, and so, what you can do on SoundCloud is you can click this button up here and start playing this song, and then you can keep scrolling down the page and lose sight of this. But then if you wanted to stop the song, there's this additional player on the bottom. So there's still separated concerns where they're going off this universal source of truth, where it's like, are we playing the song? If it's not playing the song, this changes to a play symbol, and then this changes to a play symbol based on two different controller functions. But then when we click play again, then it will run those two different controller functions and change the state of those two, of those two components, of those two views. Does that make a little more sense? Cool, awesome. Uh, any other questions before I move on? Good, cool. So yeah, that's it, boom. Um, I can show you guys like an example of what this would look like. Let's pull that up. Oh boy. Let's clear that out. So this is just one view page that I have. Um, we don't wanna see the views though. So I just wanted to give you guys an example of what I was talking about up here. So number one, the first thing that we wanna do is set up our server. So we have all of that boilerplate, we, you know, so you don't need to write this yourself. Make sure you go to the boilerplate and use that. But this is our server JS. We're no longer putting all of our routes in here. Um, I'm sure some of us are kind of used to that, um, but now it's required. So the only difference you might notice is we have the sessions, routes.sessions, and then down here we have the route setter it requires routes.js. So as I said, set up our server and now we're setting up our routes so let's go over to routes very very easy to look at right very easy to understand this is the entire file let me scroll down oh like this entire page can fit on one on one screen right it's very easy to understand exactly what's going on you know we have our login register page we have book an appointment we have login uh, if you want to edit one of the appointments you booked, um, and then a success if you know you actually posted a, a correct appointment. And then right below that, um, some of you may have seen this, but this is essentially safeguarding all of the other routes below this uh, using somewhat of like a middleware. And we're saying that off requires there to be a rec.session.docid. And if there's not, then uh, we're going to just redirect them back to the home page. And so I can show you guys an example of what this would look like, but not before showing you what sessions is. 
So sessions essentially is a, a Connex um, additional module that you can use to essentially store user um, state while they're logged in. And so again, the boilerplate in the unit has all of this in there for you, but just a quick brief um, showing of what's going on. Connex is automatically going to create this table called sessions. And then using all of this here, we're going to be generating a cookie based upon this secret string. And then we're going to designate how long we want that cookie to last for. And it's done in milliseconds. So we want it to last at a maximum of 30 days, which is two, 25 million seconds or so. And then all this other boilerplate down there as well. So what this would look like, let me check my Postico. Let's see if I got this. I don't. Let's do connects. Migrate latest. Connects. See. Okay. So for sessions. Oh, did I not blow this up? I don't know how to get in. Okay. Sorry if you guys can't see that. There's no sessions yet. Okay. Let's do node server.js. There we go. So now that we've actually spun up the server, it created that sessions table. Um, right now you can see that it's completely empty. But if we go over here, we error out because it's the wrong port. So let's make that 8,000. And now we have this web page, right? And so let's go back to the routes real quick. What routes do I have access to? So I can, I can book, I can log in, all that jazz. So let's go slash book. I can book an appointment. Uh, blow this up. Uh, what about login and register page? That works as well. But where sessions comes in and why we have this app.use off is because all of these routes below now are inaccessible, pardon me, inaccessible because we don't have a sessions created for the user. So uh, let's try going to the landing page now. Landing. Oh, all of a sudden I'm kicked back out to the home page because I'm not logged in. Um, this is essentially how we're going to be creating users, making sure that they are secure and that they don't have access to places that they don't or shouldn't have access to. And it's really, really useful for um, setting up and making sure that you, your app is bug free and that they're not seeing or viewing anything that they shouldn't be able to. So now let's create a session. I already created this user um, using connects. Oops, that's just that name. Boom. So now we're actually at that landing page. Oh, it doesn't blow up the, the URL. But this is essentially what the landing page looks like. And now we have full access to all of the routes below off because we have a rec.session. And I'll actually show you that. So if we come into session, once again, it's empty. After I logged in, it created this giant cookie. You see that? And it says that the age is 25 million. It expires on this day. It has all of this information. And then we see over here on the left, it's this giant string of characters. But this is associated with the, uh, the logged in user. So what's going on here is this string is associated with the doctor that I just logged in as. And everything that I do in this app is going to be traced back. That's not really the, the right word, but it's going to be associated with that user based upon this hash string um, identifying the user that's logged in. And so now, if I go to landing, blah, 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 blah. Let's see if we can't edit one of these. Boom. But if we take this and delete it, oh, the discard changes, oh bad. Refresh, kick back out. 
So that's essentially what Sessions is doing, is making sure that you're only letting people in that actually have a profile on your database and that are allowed to visit and access those views and pages. Um, other than that, I don't have a lot for you guys. Um, are there any questions about everything I went over? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some of that middleware is available in server. I think that's uh, this right here, require route side sessions. So, um, It works with Connect, but I believe it's an Express um, module. So it works in tandem with uh, with Connect, but um, it's actually Express session. And then this is again all in that um, boilerplate in that repository. But this is essentially just yeah, making sure that the person that's logged in is essentially being tracked in exactly what they're doing and how they're interacting with the website. And then when they're done, you know, you log out. Um, typically in a production setting, the cookie would actually be saved to your browser. But since we're in the development environment, um, we're just storing it in a table. But that's why you keep getting those weird, like, we use cookies um, warnings every time you go to websites now. Because when you click accept, um, that web page is actually saving one of those hash strings onto your actual computer. And that's why people tell you to clear your cookies often. Because... When you save a cookie to your browser, depending on the max age, um, this person now has a unique identifier of you, and it doesn't pertain necessarily to like every single website. There can be malicious cookies, but you know, more often than not, exactly what it's meant to be is just tracking exactly what you're doing when you're on their website. Like, did did he mouse over this ad, or did he click on this one thing? You know, like maybe you're into construction, maybe you clicked on woodworking or something like that production level companies will store that with your cookie and will serve you like pertinent ads based upon that information that they have stored um, based upon the cookie that you have in your browser. So um, that's essentially what a cookie is, is, is a very, very small file that certain web pages will save to your browser in order to identify you when you come onto the website, when you're logged in and using, you know, all of their um, features and products and stuff like that. Any other questions, guys? I know this is kind of like a huge dump of information, but um, all of this code, if it looks confusing, obviously there's the video, but you know, to reiterate again, there is this, uh, there is the boilerplate that Troy set up for us right here. This makes it super easy. So we have config, we have our routes, um, controllers, you know, we have the template controller, and then uh, finally database. Um, I didn't actually show you the guys the controller. Let me do that. So this is what a controller would look like. Um, it looks really, really similar to what we've been doing uh, as far as setting our routes, right? But we want to separate our routes and our controllers. We want our routes, whoops. We, are, we want our routes to look for a specific um, route, look for a specific request, and then call our controller and then actually run that function that we specify it to. So again, we went to that login register page. This is the function that's associated with um, running the login register page. Obviously, all you have to do is just render the page. There's not any pertinent information that needs to necessarily be displayed there. But if, uh, for here, we could see um, login. This is where I actually create the session for the user. So we have connect. So I'm grabbing this table where the email is equal to the request.body.email. Then I'm going to set that to a variable docs. If the password is equal to the rec.potty.password, then we're going to say that rec.session.docID is equal to the docID as long as it's equal to the password that's stored for that user. Finally, we call session. So this is what creates the cookie. This is what creates the session for the user. We say that they're authorized, they're allowed into our application. We call save, and then we say redirect to the landing page. And if this doesn't, evaluate to true if the if statement you know they answered their password in wrong then we're just going to kick them back out to the home page so this is what a controller looks like instead of it being you know a bunch of app.get app.delete app.post we're going to be exporting essentially this giant um 
list of functions that do specific things, like I said, as we're expecting the user to want or interact with. Um, you can have multiple controllers. You can have, um, not recommended, but you can have multiple routes pages as well. But as long as your number one goal is to separate um, concerns between different functionalities on, on your website, then um, you're golden. But don't go overboard creating too many controllers or routes. Obviously, you want to try and create. You want to try and have everything in one single isolated place. But uh, yeah, this is what a controller looks like. Just running different functions based upon what routes are hit. Route calls the controller. Controller goes, okay, I need to generate this view. Uh, let's find one. Um, home, right here. So right when the server gets started, we want to render home. Then we come over here and we say, you know, for all the doctors that we have, you know, create a for loop and then we'll go through. That was the uh, image you guys are looking at over here. These are all the doctors and um, yeah. So then here you could see I have an href to log register for uh, logging in, click that. And now we've been served a new view page based upon the function that the controller just ran. So the view hits the controller um, based upon the route that's inside of the, of the view. And then it generates a new view based upon the route. Um, yeah this whole dealio over here. So at first it's a little daunting, like I said, because we're separating everything out. But if you use this uh, boilerplate that Troy has in the unit, it will help you a lot. Um, I have this YouTube video I thought was pretty interesting. Um, I'll slack that out too, to help you guys maybe just answer some more higher level questions about what MVC is. Um, but other than that, do you guys have any other questions before we break out? Not 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 a breakout, but leave the room. Nothing. Are we good? All right, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll uh, upload this. I'll post this video specifically to the Slack channel, and uh, when the lecture is ready to be uploaded, I'll upload that as well. Thanks, everyone. All right.